Have you ever wondered why there was the M1 Thompson submachine gun and the M3 Grease gun submachine gun and no M2 in between? Well that's what we're taking a look at today. Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and this is in fact an M2 submachine gun. Well actually it's not exactly. This is a semi-auto reproduction of an M2 hide submachine gun. That's why it's got this kind of ugly barrel extension on it to prevent it from being a short-barreled rifle. Uh, the M2 was in fact the formally adopted successor to the Thompson M1 submachine gun. But you almost never see these, because very very few of them were made. So uh, the story behind this thing is actually it was in development a lot earlier than you might expect. The US military recognized that the Thompson was a very expensive submachine gun to manufacture. It was also a very heavy gun. There were a lot of downsides to the Thompson. Let's be honest, the Thompson is basically a first, well is, a first generation submachine gun, something that was in development during World War I. So you could actually legitimately look at the Thompson as basically the third practical submachine gun ever actually fielded behind the MP18 and uh, some of the, like the Beretta 1918 submachine guns used by the Italians. The US Army recognized this. So by the late 1930s, they were actually starting to look at, at improved submachine gun designs to replace the Thompson. And the guy who, who ended up being at the forefront of this was a guy named George Hyde. He would go on to be, really, he was quite the accomplished firearms designer, although his name isn't all that well known today. And in 1939, he actually presented a version of this uh, to the US military for testing. And they did some testing and they found it was, they liked the concept, the execution was not good. So it had a bunch of problems to it. Um, it had problems with the charging handle, it had problems with the fire control group not working well, it had problems with the bolt face cracking. Uh, after the, you know, it was, it was poorly tempered or poorly heat treated and the impact of the bolt face onto the rear of the barrel uh, over the course of this testing ended up cracking it. So a lot of problems with this gun. And this is the fall of 1939. So they send Hyde back to work uh, to, to develop this gun because like I said, they like a lot of the concepts. It's cheaper than a Thompson to make, it's better handling than a Thompson just need to kind of work out the kinks. And it took Hyde a couple of years to do this, and he did this actually with the fairly new inland division of General Motors, the guys who would become really well known for making, say, the M1 carbines. And after a couple of years, by the spring of 1942, Hyde came back with his improved version of what they called at that point the Inland Hyde II submachine gun. And that was basically this without this muzzle extension. And they did some additional, well, they did some serious testing on it in April of 1942. They fired 6,080 rounds through one of the guns. They had a total of 20 malfunctions, which kind of sounds bad, except that in reality, one of those malfunctions was a light strike, failure to fire. One of them was a failure to properly feed out of the magazine. And the other 18 were problems with the bolt hold open. So 15 of those were times when the bolt didn't properly lock open on an empty magazine. And then three of them were times when the bolt did lock open, but when they pulled the magazine out, the bolt dropped. So basically they had one little tweak to make to get the bolt hold open working just right. And if you ignore those malfunctions, they fired 6,080 rounds with two malfunctions. And that's a very good uh, result. Now, in addition to just the reliability and the endurance, the Ordnance Department, they did this testing at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, the Ordnance Department really liked the gun. Um, they found it much more accurate in full auto fire, much more effective in full auto fire than the Thompson. So at 50 yards, they set up a six by six foot target. And the Thompson, typically in their testing, the Thompson got about 50% of its rounds in full auto on that target. The M2 Hyde, well, the Inland Hyde at that point, got 100% of its rounds on that target. It weighed a couple pounds less than a Thompson. Uh, they liked the handling. It has this pretty much inline design to it, where the Thompson has a lot of drop in the buttstock. Um, this comes into your shoulder and doesn't climb, wouldn't climb nearly as much as a Thompson. So this gun was looking really good. And in fact, at the end of this testing in April of 42, it was formally adopted as the M2 submachine gun. Now at that point it was adopted as the substitute standard 
uh, behind the Thompson. And the reason for this was that they didn't want to stop manufacturing the Thompson. Uh, they needed submachine guns badly enough that the idea was we'll keep the Thompson in production until the M2 you know, comes up and, and we're getting full production rate of M2s, and then we'll taper off the Thompsons so that we never have a slowdown in our overall production of submachine guns. So the Marlin company, see Inland was busy with other projects at this time. They were able to do help hide with the development of the gun, but they didn't have the floor capacity, the factory capacity, to actually produce them. So the contract to manufacture these guns went to the Marlin Firearms Company, and they got a contract uh, to make 165,000 of them. Actually, I think it was 164,450 of them. And deliveries were supposed to start in December of 1942, so pretty quick turnaround. The problem is Marlin would have some trouble actually tooling up to make this gun. What's interesting is there were about a half a dozen parts that were, the intention was to manufacture them through a metal sintering process, where they would actually take powdered metal and compress it with very high heat and pressure, but short of actually melting it. They would compress it into a form that could be a very complex form. And the, this was a, a new process for Marlin, and the manufacturing dies to make these parts ended up being a lot more difficult for them to put together than they were anticipating. So by the time the spring of 43 rolls around, they still haven't, haven't delivered any guns, and they were supposed to have the first ones in December of 42. While this is going on, George Hyde and some of the guys at Inland are realizing, you know, we think Marlin may have trouble with this gun, so let's keep working on something. And they put together an even cheaper and simpler submachine gun design. So this was cheaper to make than the Thompson by a huge margin. The cost on this Marlin was being paid $36 and change each, as opposed to several times that much, um, at least initially, for Thompson guns. So this was good. But the, the, the follow-up design that Hyde came up with was even better, because it was made out of stamped sheet metal, it was super cheap to manufacture, and they developed that while Marlin was attempting to get this into production. Well, the first of these guns actually show up in May of 1943, and they're actually in production, they're starting to make, you know, serial production of guns, and yet the army here has the M3 grease gun now, and by the time that Marlin got these into production, the grease gun had gone through trials, it had been accepted, they realized this thing is just as good as the M2, or at least it's good enough, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper, we can make them even faster than the M2, once the M2 actually came online. And so by, in June of 43, they declared the M2 obsolete. So this had a total service life from first delivery to declared obsolescence of like a month, maybe six weeks. And in that time, only four or five hundred of them were actually produced. So that is why we have an M2, but you've never really seen one, or you probably haven't seen one. So uh, speaking of seeing one, let's go ahead and take a closer look at this. Uh, this is a semi-auto reproduction, so well, we'll get into that when you see it up close. While the Hyde is a definite improvement over the Thompson in terms of handling and weight and size, it's still a bigger gun than you might expect. So first off, forget about this. This is just on there to bring the gun up to a 16-inch barrel, so it's not a short-barreled rifle in the US. Um, originally the barrel would have ended right there. But what looks like a relatively compact gun from the side is actually really a very chunky gun when you look at it from the top. This whole receiver tube is really remarkably wide, more so than you'd normally be used to seeing. Now the reason for this, uh, I believe, I can't, can't talk to George Hyde because he has unfortunately passed away, but um, the bolt, kind of like the Thompson, has a short, has a, a narrow, a small diameter extension up here that actually chambers the round and fires it. But then once you get back behind that, the main body of the bolt here, and you can see it comes all the way back to here, is quite large in diameter. And that means you can get a lot of mass into the bolt in a relatively short uh, tube length. And I suspect that's what Hyde was going for. He wanted to avoid having a very long receiver tube, which would make for a very long and somewhat awkward gun. Um, however, this is a simple blowback mechanism, which means you have to have enough mass in the bolt to keep it opening slowly and safely. Now this of course is a, as I've said, a semi-auto reproduction, but the markings on the side here are very faithfully copied over from 
the original. Now I've put a piece of tape over the our, our viewer's name here on because I'm not sure he necessarily wants his name splashed all over YouTube. Uh, but what you originally would have had is M2 hide inland, uh, caliber 45, a serial number. Uh, this one is one because it's this uh, semi-auto repro. And then these were actually manufactured by the Marlin Firearms Company of New Haven, Connecticut. So he did a cool job reproducing those original markings. The sights on the hide are a, uh, a combination aperture and notch. So your primary sight is this aperture, and then there is also a notch on top uh, for longer range uh, shooting. The front sight is a nice tall, tall square front post there with a couple of protective wings. The hide was designed to use standard Thompson submachine gun magazines, so <laughs> and it has a magazine release that is much better than the actual Thompson. So to pull the magazine out, you just push this button back, pull it down. It has a locking button right there that locks into this hole on the magazine. Now I'm not going to take this gun apart because there are a number of substantial differences because it's a semi-auto reproduction. Um, the original hide guns had a quick detach sort of lever right here to allow you to take the fire control group out. This one has a pair of socket head bolts holding it in. Um, on the original one you would pull off the front band here, and then you just had to pop a lever open which would allow this to come out, and then the whole action came out of the stock. Um, th that isn't quite duplicated here, so I'm not going to go ahead and show you. In addition, this has an AR-15 hammer-fired fire control group in it um, to work as a nice drop-in semi-auto fire control group. The original uh, hide design was an open bolt design. It did have a, fi a, a floating firing pin, but it was an open bolt firing gun, and it had a single, uh, had a, a dual recoil spring, but um, nested. Uh, so one recoil spring on top of a second buffer spring to decelerate the bolt at the end of its travel. Uh, this reproduction has a pair of just standard recoil springs and guides in it. So the internals aren't actually going to show you what the original gun would have looked like, so we'll pass on those for the moment. Instead, we're going to go ahead and actually take this out to the range and do a little bit of shooting with it. So in some ways there's not a lot that we can learn from actually shooting this reproduction because it's got a muzzle brake that's not original, it's got an AR-15 trigger in it which is a completely different sort of trigger pull than the original would have had as a submachine gun, and of course it's semi-auto only. I don't know if the spring rates are exactly the same as the original gun, so recoil impulse and everything having to do with full auto, I really can't infer anything about the real gun from this one. However, what I can learn about is the, the static handling of the gun, because dimensionally this is a faithful reproduction of an actual M2 hide submachine gun. So things like the really remarkable width of the receiver here, how the pistol grip handles, how the length of pull is, how the sights are, all of that sort of thing we can legitimately learn from with a semi-auto copy like this. And what I get from that is it's probably a good thing that the US government didn't end up really, well didn't end up actually putting this into mass production. Um, the length of pull is a bit long, the gun is remarkably heavy, certainly a lot heavier than a grease gun. It's better than a Thompson, but like you can kind of feel that there's still room to go compared to the Thompson. Um, you know, this is sort of an intermediary both chronologically between the Thompson and the grease gun, and also like physically and dimensionally. The grip's big, the stock's big, the, the, you know, the whole action is big. It's a great shooting carbine in semi-auto, of course, because it's got a magnificent trigger in it. Recoil is fairly low. It's got a little bit more abrupt kick than I would have expected. I suspect the bolt may be bottoming out on the back end of the receiver, but I don't know if that's true to the originals or not. And I'm out of ammo.
Now the reason I even have this semi-auto reproduction here to look at is that it was generously loaned to me by one of our uh, awesome viewers who took it upon himself to make a semi-auto reproduction of this gun, because he thinks they're really cool. And he's not wrong, they are really cool. So uh, in total, I believe six of these survive, six actual original ones, two of those being transferables in private hands. Um, I believe one of them is a post sample in private hands and the other three are in museums. So very low survival rate, you know, they only made a couple hundred, it was during the war, most of them didn't survive the war. So hopefully one of these days I will manage to get my hands on one of the originals and then we can tear it apart and I can show you what Hyde's actual internals look like in a proper original submachine gun instead of a semi-auto reproduction like this one. But, um, oh and by the way, uh, from what I've been told, from what I've read and heard, these were actually really good guns to shoot in full auto. Um, they had a relatively low rate of fire, something like 550 rounds per minute, somewhere between five and 600 rounds a minute. Um, they had a pretty good inline uh, recoil impulse. They didn't tend to climb. Uh, so were they, is that quality worth the extra cost that it would have required to get M2s instead of M3s, well, in wartime, that's that's a kind of a different sort of logistical question. Um, and we'll never really know, will we? So at any rate, uh, a big thank you to the very awesome viewer who loaned me this gun to bring uh, on video for you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.